Welcome back to Sissy Maya. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to never miss an update. Additionally, consider subscribing to my Patreon to get access to these features, and much more. 14-year-old Jake Walker let out a sigh. He had spent much of the school day gazing at Monica Grant, one of the school's most beautiful girls. She had softly curling black hair cascading to her shoulders, flawless emerald green eyes, a charming upturned nose, and a well-proportioned figure with a pair of legs any model would envy. Jake harbored quite the crush on her, a sentiment that had persisted throughout the school year. I'd love to meet her, he mused, though he knew it was unlikely. At his age, Jake still resembled a grade schooler despite being a high school freshman. School posed its challenges, with bullies, teachers mistaking him for a girl due to his long hair, and the monotonous repetition of concepts he grasped easily. Why the uh? Teresa, Jake's two years older sister, inquired upon entering the room with her school books. Teresa, a popular blue eyed blonde with a changeable demeanor, placed her books on the table and queried, How was your day? I've got heaps of homework from Mrs. Baker, including a Second World War assignment due next week. Could you assist me? Jake glanced at Teresa and replied, Sure but I won't do the entire thing like last time. Right. You used your computer. I didn't see you penning anything. Oh, why bother? I did all the work for you. You just had to hand in your paper. Carol, do you know Monica Grant? Perhaps I do, perhaps I don't. Why? I was just thinking, maybe I could tackle that assignment for you if... If what? Well, if you could introduce me to her. I might consider doing your work. Teresa pondered the idea for a few moments before responding, I'm not sure. I can give it a shot, but I can't guarantee anything. Despite her familiarity with Monica, she was uncertain about how to approach her. Monica had a history of quickly ending relationships with overly macho guys, she preferred quieter types, though they hesitated to approach her due to the constant presence of the jarks around her. Please. Just try for me, Jake pleaded, knowing Teresa was aware of his crush. Okay, I'll give it a shot. No promises, Teresa agreed. I'll do whatever's reasonable, Teresa. I just want a chance to meet her. All right, you've got it. Their parents arrived home at that moment, announcing, we picked up Chinese takeout. There's shrimp fried rice, egg rolls, and more. Both siblings loved Chinese food and quickly indulged themselves. Hey, fortune cookies, Jake exclaimed, grabbing one and cracking it open. His fortune read, when you think with your feet, you forget your heart. Another cookie revealed, black and white can create many shades of grey. Interesting, remarked their mother, opening her own cookie to read, don't count your eggs before their omelette. Or scrambled, their father added, reading his fortune. Fortune may arrive slowly, but it departs swiftly. After dinner, the parents settled in to watch TV while the children tackled their homework. Around 10.30, they all retired for the night. The following day at school, Jake endured the usual taunts from the jocks, bullies, and their followers. Despite the challenges, he continued to observe Monica and effortlessly answered the teacher's questions having heard the same material countless times before. Four days on end, Jake resigned himself to the idea that meeting Monica was a distant dream. Oh well, he reflected, I suppose it was never meant to happen. It's foolish to think someone like Monica would want to spend time with someone like me. I shouldn't have even entertained the idea. About two weeks later, on a Thursday afternoon after school, his sister entered the room where he was engrossed in a book on Greek theatre and declared, I think I can arrange for you to see Monica, but there's a condition. You must strictly adhere to her instructions, no exceptions. I've written them down. If you're not on board, forget about meeting her. She'll agree to meet you, but only on her terms. All right, I'm willing. When can I meet her? Jake inquired. Well, her parents will be out of town this weekend and mom and dad have a two-day work seminar, so Saturday seems feasible. Okay with you? Teresa proposed. Sure, what should I wear, something casual? Jake asked. Leave that to me. There are specific instructions regarding attire, 
Teresa replied cryptically. Curious about the undisclosed details, Jake wondered where this was heading. Well, at least I have a chance. Hopefully, she'll find me somewhat likable. She does seem nice, he mused. So, should I call her, or do you want to drop the whole thing? You could always consider Maggie Thomas, Teresa suggested. I'll go with the call. I'm willing to meet on her terms, Jake decided. Okay, I agree. Memories of what they called Maggie flooded Jake's mind, she was labelled the school's biggest gossip. He sympathised with her past struggles, being one of her few friends, which only isolated him further. Jake observed as his sister dialed a number and engaged in conversation. After a brief exchange, Teresa announced, Hi, Monica. Jake agrees to your terms and wants to try this weekend. Following a moment of listening, she continued, So, around 9.30 to 10 on Saturday morning. I can prepare him and have him there by 9.45. Does that work for you? Teresa flashed a mischievous grin and declared, We're all set for this weekend. With that, she concluded the call, and both siblings resumed their homework. That night, Jake struggled to sleep, consumed by thoughts of meeting Monica. Just don't embarrass yourself, don't make any foolish mistakes, he repeated to himself. This is your opportunity. Don't mess it up. The routine at school on Friday felt like a haze, his mind preoccupied solely with thoughts of Monica. Once home, he observed his sister bringing in two bags from her car and carrying them upstairs to her room. What's in the bags, sis? Jake inquired. Nothing you need to worry about right now, Teresa replied cryptically. Okay, Jake acquiesced, returning his focus to the book he had been reading. Half an hour later, the family convened for dinner. Following the meal, their parents issued instructions, Teresa, you're in charge. We'll be back late on Sunday night, and we don't expect you to stay up waiting. The contact number is by the phone. In case of emergencies, reach out to Ms. Taylor or Mr. Carlyle. They both have our contact information. We trust you both to behave responsibly. With their parents' departure, each child exchanged kisses and promises to behave before watching the car pull out of the driveway. They stood on the porch, waving goodbye until their parents' car disappeared from view. Well, they're off for the weekend. Any homework? Teresa inquired of Jake. Nope. Finished mine during study hall. You. Jake replied. Lucky you. All right, want to watch the game show, or? Teresa trailed off. For a while, what's on? Jake responded. The two settled in and watched a game show, flipped through channels to catch a travel program, a sitcom, and then found themselves engrossed in a police chase. I'm getting tired. Tomorrow I get to see Monica, right? Jake reminded. Oh, that's right. I have some tasks for you tonight, Teresa stated with a grin. I'll fetch the things you'll need. You'll want to check the lights, ensure the front door's locked, and I should have everything ready in about ten minutes. Okay. Sure, Jake agreed, feeling a bit puzzled about what was in store. Ten minutes later, Jake entered his room to find a bottle of hair conditioner, shampoo, skin lotion, and something labelled Nair. His sister joined him and instructed, after you shower, apply the Nair to your arms, legs, chest, just follow the instructions. Then, use the lotion. Wash your hair thoroughly with the shampoo and conditioner I've provided. You'll wear the attire I'll lay out for you. Remember our agreement. Yeah, got it, Jake affirmed. After his shower, he followed the instructions, though he found the smell of the Nair less than pleasant. As he rinsed it off, he was surprised to see the hair going down the drain. Applying the lotion, he was taken aback by its fragrance. Oh, there's some dusting powder there too, don't forget to use it, Teresa reminded him from outside the bathroom. I won't, Jake replied as he began to shampoo his hair, following up with the conditioner and powder. Now, off to bed, and tomorrow, Monica. As he returned to his bedroom, he was taken aback. Teresa, what's happening? Why are your things on my bed? Teresa walked in, saying, No, you'll wear them tonight. Jake glanced at the nightgown and resignedly muttered, Well, if I have to, 
I have to. Just leave, and let me get ready for bed. He discarded the towel and donned the pale blue satin panties, followed by a pale blue bra with a bow on the front. Teresa, I can't reach the back of this thing. Can you help? He called out. Teresa returned, inserted two pads into the front of the bra, and fastened the hooks at the back. She observed as Jake slipped into a baby blue nylon nightgown, placing a pink chenille robe on a chair nearby and a pair of pink mules under the bed. These are for when you wake up, she explained, gesturing toward the robe and slippers. I'll be waking you up quite early. At around seven in the morning, Teresa roused him with, time to wake up, sleepyhead. Breakfast is almost ready. Jake rose, donned the pink robe and slippers, and tended to his morning routine in the bathroom. Downstairs, Teresa welcomed him, scrambled eggs, bagel with cream cheese, sausage, hash browns, and toast. All set on the table. What juice would you like? Orange. No coffee? Jake inquired. We're out. Once you're done, we'll clean up, and then I'll get you ready. Finally, the awaited day arrived. Almost forgotten amidst the preparations was Monica. Okay, Jake responded, digging into the food. So, what's on the agenda? He quickly filled his belly, acknowledging Teresa's culinary skills. I hope you're not too shy. I'll wait until the dishes are cleared, then, well, you'll find out. Teresa teased. After breakfast, the table was cleared, the dishes washed, and put away. Teresa announced, I'll need you upstairs in fifteen minutes. I'm going to get dressed and prepare everything for you. Jake waited the allotted time before ascending the stairs. Although he felt a bit peculiar in girls' clothing, he couldn't deny the comfort of the satin panties. Upon entering his room, he noticed a rubber sheet on the bed and an item from his past at the foot of the bed. His sister entered the room and instructed, OK, strip down completely, lay face down on the bed on the sheet. With you watching. Can't you at least turn around? Jake protested. Teresa obediently turned as Jake divested himself of the robe, slippers, gown, bra, and panties. Undressed and hairless, at least on his body, Jake got on the bed, laid face down and said, you can turn around now. He felt something poured on his backside and gently rubbed in. What is that stuff? Jake asked. Next sensation was of a powder being applied to him. Baby powder and oil. Okay, turn over. Jake turned over, and felt something under him. He lay there watching as his sister brought a triangular piece of soft cloth up between his legs, and two other pieces from either side of his body. What the hell? This is a diaper. You agreed, remember, said his sister as she fastened safety pins to hold it in place. Yeah, I guess so. She next held up the next article, elastic panties. She worked them up his legs, over the diaper. Now the third item came into view. A pair of rumba panties, the kind little girls wear. Now, can you stand up for mommy, sweetheart? Teresa was getting into the spirit of things. Jake stood, and waited for the next indignation. A training bra was next, then a petticoat slip. Pointing to a chair, she said, sit down, I'll put shoes and socks on you. Jake sat down, and watched as Teresa put a pair of knee-high socks and a pair of Mary Yanes, at least he thought that was what they were, on him, and fastened the straps. When told, he rather submissively stood and waited. Sis then put the dress on him. It was an ivory-coloured little girl's party dress with a lacy underskirt and buttons up the back. She then took him to a mirror. He looked like he was eight or nine years old, and a girl to boot. Sis, I can't go out looking like this. Shush, sweetheart, everything's going to be all right, his sister said, giving him a kiss on the forehead. Turn around so mommy can button up the back. Jake turned, angry with himself. He smelled something, and it wasn't perfume. Teresa secured the buttons, tied a sizable bow, then moved to a dresser. Returning, she adorned Jake's wrist with a charm bracelet and draped a locket chain around his neck. She then affixed two clip-on earrings. After brushing and styling Jake's hair, she pulled it back and tied a hair ribbon into a large bow. A touch of foundation, a hint of blush, 
and a subtle coral lipstick completed the transformation. Despite his naturally thin eyebrows, Jake appeared quite feminine. Almost done? Jake asked. Yep. I've got a purse for you downstairs, Teresa replied. She led him to a mirror and admired how lovely he appeared. Jake gazed at his reflection and saw a very pretty young girl staring back at him. She seemed about nine or ten years old, almost ready to head out to a party. Let's go, sweetie. Your friends are waiting. Teresa escorted Jake downstairs, handed him his purse, helped him into a girl's coat, and remarked, You look so pretty, my dear. I'm proud of you. Around fifteen past nine, they departed, Joe trailing Teresa to her car, hoping none of the neighbors would spot him. She opened the passenger side door, ensured he was settled, and then buckled his seatbelt. Once she was seated in the driver's side, she fastened her own seatbelt. Despite Monica's house being just a 15-minute walk away, due to one-way streets, a bridge under repair, and day tours, it ended up being a 10-minute drive. Arriving at Monica's, Joe observed several bikes parked beside the house, prompting his curiosity. Teresa parked in the street out front, exited the car, and circled around to Joe's side. Well, here we are, she announced as if it weren't obvious. After assisting Joe out of the car, she locked it, checked the doors, then took his hand and guided him towards the house. Upon entering, Joe noticed several girls present, including Monica and Maggie. They were all clad in boys' shirts, sneakers, and pants or jeans, and upon spotting him, the laughter began. He felt nauseated, the laughter ringing in his ears, mocking him as the sissy. Their comments stabbed at him, look how adorable he is, isn't he just precious, oh, what a sweet little girl. To them, he was nothing but a joke. It was a cruel prank, and he couldn't believe he fell for it, allowing himself to be utterly humiliated. Please, sis, I want to leave, please just take me home, he pleaded desperately. No, you've just arrived. Teresa insisted. Joe couldn't bear another moment of their ridicule. The laughter at school, now this. Please, I just want to go home, I'll never ask you for anything again, just take me home. No, Teresa began, but Joe abruptly pulled away from her grasp and bolted for the door. One of the girls attempted to stop him, and in a moment of desperation, he shoved her aside, a move he'd never have imagined himself making. Jake, Jake, please stop. Come back, please. Teresa's pleas fell on deaf ears as he sprinted outside. Tears streamed down his face, a sensation he hadn't experienced in eight years, leaving his cheeks streaked. How could she? My own sister. I should have known better. I thought I could trust her, but not any more. I'm finished at school. This will spread like wildfire, and I'll really get it now, he lamented, though he no longer cared. Let them see me like this, he resolved as he ran. All he desired was to return home, to the safety of his room. He dashed down streets, across lawns, over a bridge, until finally reaching his own street. He would soon be safe. His heart raced, his breaths came in rapid gasps, and despite stumbling several times, he picked himself up and continued as if pursued by demons. Finally, he reached his house. Here, he would find solace. Fumbling in his purse, he searched for the door key. Was it deliberately left there? Jake pondered. At the bottom of the bag lay a key, a door key. Spying Teresa's car approaching, he swiftly inserted the key into the lock, turned it, and as the door swung open, he hurried inside, slamming it shut behind him. Darting upstairs to the sanctuary of his room, he locked the door, wedged a chair beneath the knob, and cranked up his CD player to full volume, blasting Ravel's bolero. Rather fitting, he mused. The first order of business was shedding the clothing. He tore it off, discarding it in a frenzy. Once unclothed, he slipped into his own boy clothes, instantly feeling a sense of relief. The torn garments lay in tatters strewn across the room. Opening a window, he disposed of the offending items, along with the bottles of products left behind by his sister, transforming the yard into a makeshift dump. The locket, earrings, and bracelet remained as reminders of his sister's betrayal. Seeking solace in the most clamorous and aggressive PC game he could find, 
He cranked up the volume to its maximum, each virtual kill serving as retribution against Teresa, Monica, Maggie, and their cohorts. Jake, Jake, please open this door. We need to talk. Please, Teresa pleaded. Ignoring her, Jake continued his virtual onslaught, assigning each victim a familiar face. Leave me alone, forever. I want nothing to do with you, Monica, or any of your friends. I was foolish to trust you in the first place. She'll give up soon, Jake surmised. Setting his CD player on repeat and keeping the game running, he vowed not to emerge from his room until his parents returned. Jake, open this door now. Teresa's voice rang out, nearly drowned by the cacophony within. Resorting to pounding on the door, she pleaded, Please, Jake, just talk to me. Eventually, her knuckles began to ache from the force of her banging. Trying a different tactic, she warned, I'll call mom and dad. They won't be pleased about this. Who cares? Certainly not me, Jake mused. Feel free to call. Perhaps they'd be interested to hear your side of the story too. With a trump card in hand, he added, maybe they'd also like to know about the time you got drunk at that party. He felt no obligation to her anymore, certainly not friendship. Actually, if you don't stop bothering me, I'll spill everything to mom and dad when they return. Crushed, Teresa realized he held power over her, he knew all her darkest secrets. Fine, you win, just leave me alone now. I never want to talk to you again, Jake asserted. The remainder of the day was spent in his room, munching on candy bars, listening to his CD player, and gaming. Mostly, he cried. He felt like nothing but a joke, an object of ridicule. The prospect of a future filled with loneliness seemed bearable, but not the laughter. That night, a lonely 14-year-old boy named Jake Walker cried himself into a restless sleep. In a nearby house, a solitary girl with softly curling black hair cascading over her shoulders, flawless emerald green eyes, and a cute upturned nose also wept herself to sleep.